It's Monday, October 17th. From inside the WTOP newsroom, this is the DMV Download, brought to you by the men and women of Steamfitters Local 602. Get an estimate and learn more at steamfitters-602.org. Today, as D.C. voters open their mail-in ballots, one of their biggest decisions will be on whether to phase out the tipped wage for many restaurant, bar, and nail salon workers. It would essentially make any tips a worker earns extra, rather than it is now, which is built into their daily minimum wage. If you go out to eat or drink in D.C., this will apply to you. And we've got both sides of the argument for you, starting with Ryan O'Leary with One Fair Wage. The people who serve us food and serve us drinks, they deserve to be able to live in this city and they deserve to be able to thrive. And this is what Initiative 82 will allow them to be able to do. If this issue sounds familiar, that's because it is. D.C. voters took up a similar referendum back in 2018. They voted to eliminate tipped wages, but the council stepped in to keep it anyway. The Restaurant Association of Metropolitan Washington was really behind that push to keep tip wages in place, and they're in that position again this time around. We talked to Jeff Tracy, better known as Chef Jeff, about why he thinks Initiative 82 should not be supported. It'll probably become a little bit more expensive for the operator, become a little bit more expensive for the customer. And at the end of the day, I don't think the servers make any more money than they're already making right now. Thanks for joining us. I'm Megan Cloherty. And I'm Luke Garrett. Now, this is a very complicated issue, Megan. There's a lot to unpack here because it has to do with wages and to be specific, tipped wages, which is a structure that basically combines a base rate with a tipped wage. Yeah. And essentially, I mean, either way you pay someone, whether we do the tipped wage as we have it now or the system changes, people are still going to make their minimum wage. Correct. It's just how they make it. So for an example, just to like lay this out for somebody who doesn't understand, if I am working at a nail salon and I make five thirty five an hour in mm-hmm. DC, which is the sub minimum wage. Thank you. That's the word. I will then make in tips up to sixteen dollars and ten cents an hour or above it. But as yes. long as I hit that sixteen dollars and ten cents an hour, that is my minimum wage for that hour. Right. If I don't make any tips that hour, Mm -hmm. my employer has to fill the gap. Make the difference. Exactly. So I'm going to leave with Mm $16.10 an hour. But if I am a bartender or I'm somebody who is getting more tips, maybe I could make way more than that. Correct. Now, that's the system that's currently in place and could get rolled back if Initiative 82 were passed. If Initiative 82 were passed, there would no longer be this sub-minimum wage and tipped wage combination. It would just be... One wage. Yeah, sixteen ten an hour, yeah. and then whatever you tip on top of that is just gravy. Correct. And the employer could determine what that wage is as long as it's above that sixteen ten minimum wage. So one thing to note here, too, is it wouldn't be an immediate change. This is a phasing out of the tipped wage if Initiative 82 passes. So it would be slowly going to the minimum wage completely by 2027. Mm-hmm. And so we have both sides of this contentious issue for you. And first up, we have Ryan O'Leary with One Fair Wage. He is pro Initiative 82. He used to be a server and he's lived in the district for 10 years. Ryan, thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, why do you think that voters should approve Initiative 82? Yeah, so there's a lot of reasons why. <laughs> but uh, I guess most uh, true to or relevant for D.C. voters is the fact that they already did approve this uh, overwhelmingly 55 to 45 percent in 2018 when it was known as Initiative 77. After heavy industry lobbying, uh, especially by the local restaurant lobby, Ram W, uh, the council overturned the will of the people. And I think that especially given COVID and the, the changes to work in general over the past few years and in the changes to the council. I think it's high time that we actually, you know, implement what voters have decided to implement and make it the law of D.C. and pay everybody a fair wage with tips on top. Mm. And to kind of dig deeper into, you know, the people will be most affected by this, namely workers in these industries. You worked as a server for a long time. Tell us what it was like having a wage that was dependent on not necessarily your employer, but the customer's you were serving how what was that experience like and why is it you know in your opinion not fair and why should we move towards a more stable paying structure it's it's a rough job it's, it can be a very fulfilling job you know i really did enjoy my time as a server um and you can make good money but you, at the end of the day you're at the whims of a customer um and a lot of times that customer 
you know, can be discriminatory, whether I mean, people who don't look like me who aren't white men generally make less in tips than um, people who do look like me. Um, on top of that, you know, there's something called tip out that a lot of customers don't necessarily know about, which is the fact that a certain percentage of your sales as a server, um, you tip out that percentage of your sales. Often it's percentage of sales, not percentage of tips to your server, your or your busser, your food runner, your bartender and bar back to help supplement their sub minimum wage as well. Mm. Um, and so that means if you're waiting on somebody and they spend a hundred bucks and you're spending, you're expecting about 20 bucks uh, in tip off that, let's say about $8 of that is going to go to your uh, support staff. And so if you don't tip me anything, I have to reach into my own pocket and find $8 to tip out my uh, my support staff with. So it's just inherently unfair. And tips were, were always designed to be something on top of your base wages. They were never meant to be some supplements to the employer's you know, uh, wage obligations to their employees. Do you think, Ryan, that this, I mean, just devil's advocate here, that in structuring the tip to be part of what you made every hour, it incentivized people to like try harder, do better, be like better servers or better bartenders. But now that you're going to make the full, I mean, if this passes, right, you'd make the full minimum wage an hour. Um, do you think it's, you know, just incentivizes someone to maybe go the extra mile? Well, what's great is that we don't need to uh, guess or, you know, imagine what it will be like. There are seven states that already have eliminated the subminimum wage. Uh, one of those is California. And in L.A. and San Francisco, where the minimum wage is $15 for tipped workers, uh, not only is the service still great, but people still tip. Um, and, you know, I have servers, I have, you know, friends who bartended in D.C., were against Initiative 77 because they thought that their tips were going to go away. Mm. They've since moved out to L.A. They're bartending there. And they, they've they they've just told me, they're like, I have I can't understand for the life of me why I was so against Initiative 77. I'm buying my first house. I just got back from, you know, uh, my honeymoon in Europe. I'm thriving. And it's because I'm able to make a full minimum wage and tips on top. Mm. So in other words, the Initiative 82, you're saying, could really increase the wages of these sorts of workers in D.C. Absolutely. I mean, you look at hotel workers that are unionized right now um, that work as bartenders and servers. Most of them are making $20 or more per hour. Um, and that's the power of collective bargaining plus tips on top. And so I think you're going to see, you know, the people who serve us food and service drinks, they deserve to be able to live in this city and they deserve to be able to thrive. And this is what Initiative 82 will allow them to be able to do. Ryan, are there any numbers as far as like projected polling on, on how many people are expected to vote on this? Because to be honest, I think there might be a lot of skepticism from some D.C. voters about, hey, I voted for this when it was 77. The council overturned my vote. What's the point? Right. I mean, I don't want to I don't want to say that that's how they should feel. But I'm wondering if there's a feeling out there like this, like, well, isn't the council just going to do what they want? Yeah, so I've uh, the majority of the council, almost every council member has said that they will not overturn this. Um, and to even further that fact, I've had six council members sign a pledge saying that they will not alter, amend, or otherwise, you know, contradict the essence of the initiative if and when it is uh, approved by voters. Okay. So I think we can all rest assured that uh, if it does pass again this time, um, it will go into law. Um, likely early March due to the whole process of congressional review. Mm. And, you know, we've talked a lot about the workers here, which is really the most important, you know, subject of this issue. But there's also kind of a perspective of the customer. If Initiative 82 goes through, how will the customer experience, you know, change at all? Will, will they experience any shift or will it kind of just be more of the same? Oh, yeah, especially with the phase out, like, yeah, idea. Exactly. It's not just going to be like on January 1st, this changes. Yeah. Um, so again, something I often, uh, you know, people are often worried about price increases and changes to the level of service. And, you know, there are uh, lots of restaurant owners here um, who also have restaurants in California, in Nevada, um, other places where there isn't a sub minimum wage. And uh, you can look at the menu prices out in those out in those areas. They're very comparable, if not a little bit more of a bargain compared to in D.C. Um, and so I really don't think that there's a uh, there should be a big worry over some drastic price increase. I also, you know, I, for a short amount of time, worked at a restaurant in Minneapolis, another state without a subminimum wage. No discernible difference, at least from my end as a worker in the industry, to the customer experience. Um, the only difference was in that restaurant, I was able to, we were able to pool tips with back of house. 
because we were all making at least the full minimum wage. And so if anything, service got better because then the uh, the people who make the food also had an invested interest in the customer's experience. Right. Do you think there's anything that when we talk about uh, Initiative 82 that is not discussed that should be? Hmm. You know, I think it's important that, I mean, there there's a, there's a lot of talk over the fact that apparently restaurant workers don't want this. Um, and I can't emphasize how far from the truth that is. Um, Lake Research Partners, a pretty reputable polling agency, um, they did a poll about a year ago of, t- of only tipped workers in D.C. and found nearly 90 percent support this initiative. Um, and so I think it's important to remember that tipped workers are more than just the bartender at the high end bar you like to frequent. They're the servers at Denny's and IHOP. They're the bussers and food runners are the people who really run this city. Mm-hmm. And uh, they overwhelmingly do support this. Mm. The last question that just occurred to me is, you know, tipping is kind of a cultural phenomenon, kind of unique to the United States. In Europe, there's more of a, a base pair for servers and tipping is less of a cultural phenomenon. Is there a risk that as our country and maybe just D.C. changes to a more, if Initiative 82 happens, that tipping will go away and it won't be a revenue stream for these workers. Is that a fear at all? You know, it's funny because there are always some restaurants that like to experiment with a no tipping allowed model. And it's actually the customers who get the most irate when they have to go to those restaurants. Uh, it's You're right. It is a, it is a uniquely American cultural institution. Um and Americans really like to do it. Um, they 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 get mad when they can't tip for good service, mm. uh, or where they can't you know give a gratuity for um, a service that was given to them. So, you know, maybe in generations. I mean, because also I don't think this is going to happen federally for a very long time. Right. Um, but you know, I don't think it's of any immediate worry to anybody. Um, you know. This isn't going to radically change the culture. All it's going to do is radically change the um, the earning wages and the living standards of tipped workers around this city. Ryan O'Leary with One Fair Wage. Thank you for you know sharing your insight on this. We really appreciate your perspective. Thanks for having me. And after the break, we hear a different story regarding Initiative 82. We hear from Chef Jeff himself, Jeff Tracy. Backed by the experience of its hardworking members, Steamfitters Local 602 is ready to take on your next commercial heating, cooling, HVAC, or refrigeration project. Steamfitters Local 602 adds value to our community through its partnerships with local contractors and building owners, all while keeping the focus on improving the lives of its members and their families throughout the DMV. For work that's on time and on budget, go to steamfitters-602.org to schedule your next project. That's steamfitters-602.org. Steamfitters Local 602 changing lives. I'm Paul Wagner. Join me as I dig deep into the mysterious case of the Potomac River Rapist. Listen to Unknown Subject, Season 3 of WTOP's award-winning American Nightmare podcast series, available now wherever you get your podcasts. We return now to the issue of Initiative 82, which again is a referendum on the D.C. ballot this November. We just heard the argument for passing the referendum, but restaurant owners say it will ultimately hurt workers and the industry as a whole, especially now. The Restaurant Association of Metropolitan Washington has mounted a large campaign to vote no on 82, and it's funded by some of the large restaurant groups, including some that you know very well, like Barcelona Wine Bar, Founding Farmers, Silver Diner, and Jose Andres's Think Food Group. Um, so, too, is CGD, Jeff Tracy's group. And Jeff, who many people know as Chef Jeff, joins us now. Jeff, thanks for making the time for us. My pleasure. Um, first off, why should voters oppose phasing out a tipped wage in D.C.? Why is it a bad move for workers, customers and owners? Well, this is a very, very complicated situation. And, and you, you talk about like, you know, restaurants, large restaurants that have, have contributed to this campaign. Um no one wants to be contributing. No restaurant wants to be contributing to this campaign because we'd much rather keep our own money so that we can, you know, put it into our own operations. Right. This was something that, you know, we're on the defense here, the outside, you know, groups that, you know, basically funded this um, ballot initiative, you know, want to sort of change the entire sort of landscape of how the, payroll system works in, 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 a, in a restaurant environment. Mm. And so 
which is fine. I'm not sure a ballot initiative is the right place to deal with a very complex sort of, you know, um, business economic payroll issue, mm-hmm. but it's here um, and it's and it's coming up on November 8th. I think tipped employees, um, I think tipped wages are a great option for a lot of people. It's not for everybody. And it's very easy to get a job as a fixed wage hourly employee. You can do it at restaurants. You could do it at Amazon, Starbucks. You get a job at WTOP (laughs) um, where you know exactly how much you're going to make every single hour. Mm. Servers, tipped employees, people who choose to take on a tipped employees are guaranteed to get the base minimum wage, which is $16 and change right now. But a lot of their wages come from tips, but they have a large upside. So at Chef Jeff's, my servers make between $30 and $40 an hour, Mm. which is a lot more than you can make in a lot of places. You know, frequently we have situations in which tipped employees are making more than sort of salaried managers. Um, They're making more than some of the journalists who are interviewing me about these things. Um, And so I think it's just a great opportunity. Tipped wages are a great opportunity for some groups of people. Mm. In other words, there's a real big potential to make big money. It's not necessarily uh, assured, but that potential is really worth it. Now, back in 2018, we saw a similar initiative, 77, that kind of covered a very similar issue. Voters supported it, and then the D.C. Council ultimately didn't let it go through to law. But what was different about this initiative and back then in 2018 is that we've gone through a pandemic. What does that mean for voters who are thinking about Mm -hmm. this initiative this time around now that the pandemic has really hurt restaurants? Does that play in at all? Yeah, I mean, I guess it plays into the reality of the situation. Uh, You know, restaurants have gone through a lot over the last few years, but the restaurant business has always been complicated and and challenging. So I think it would have been difficult after I-77, and I think it will be complicated after I-82. Do restaurants have the resolve to get through something like this? Absolutely. But I do not think that the advocates who are advocating for this um, initiative understand how a payroll system or the profit and loss statement works in a, in a restaurant. I do not think that the servers at Chef Jeff's or at other restaurants that are making $30, $40 an hour are all of a sudden going to be making $40 or $50 an hour. A uh, question for you, Jeff. We just spoke with Ryan O'Leary over at One Fair Wage, and he was saying how the, the concept that a lot of customers don't understand when they're leaving a tip or not leaving a tip, depending, is the tip back situation where a lot of servers in, in different restaurants have to share the tip they get with the bus boys and the cooks and, and what have you. Um, I mean, is that a, a concern when it comes to this? Do you think more people are making like that 40 and $50 or more people are facing a reality where they didn't make enough tip and they're having to pull out eight bucks out of their own pocket to contribute to the tip back? So each restaurant has a, has a sort of a system in terms of getting the compensation because the compensation, go, the tips go directly to the server or the bartender and they typically tip out food runners or barbacks. But the servers, when I'm saying they're making 30 or $40 an hour, that's after they've tipped out all those people. Okay. And I would say, you know, my restaurants are, you know, nice and busy and, 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 and great and all, but certainly there are other restaurants that you can work in, in Washington, DC that you would generate far more in tips on an hourly basis. I mean, you know, back in the day when I worked in other places, I worked at the old debit grill and there were bartenders making, making six figures. Um, so this just feels like a weird thing that the advocates are advocating for because these people are opting into this situation and they enjoy the situation because of the upside. So ultimately you think if initiative A2 were to pass, workers would be paid less at the end of the day? No. I actually think they'll end up being, um, I think I think restaurant operators will try to create a situation in which everybody's sort of relatively made whole, but the pie is going to be sliced up in, in different ways. You're going to end up seeing a lot of, you know, service charges in the tune of, call it, you know, somewhere between 8 and 12% or something like that. And then they'll put a line in there for, you know, any additional gratuity. I'll end up, end up having to take that 8 to 12% offsetting the 
additional payroll expenses I, I have on the payroll for you know getting the servers from that that tipped wage to the full minimum wage, and then I'm going to have to sort of compensate them to get them back towards that thirty or forty dollars an hour. Mm. But like I said, I don't think it's going to get them to forty or fifty dollars an mm. hour. So I think I think what restaurant operators will do is try to get it so that it sort of all kind of balances out because customers don't really want to pay any more than they're already paying. And I don't think many operators can afford to pay any more than what they're paying their tipped employees or, or their overall staffs in its entirety. Gotcha. Cause it's a, it's a, it's a low, it's a low margin business. Mm. Um, so I, I, I think it's again, a very, very challenging thing. You know, and, and of course, service charges will be taxed. They'll, they'll get a sales tax. So the customer ends up having to pay 6% sales tax on, on any service charges that are that are um, incurred. So, you know, it'll probably become a little bit more expensive for the operator, become a little bit more expensive for the customer. And at the end of the day, I don't think the servers make any more money than they're already making right now. And at $30, $40 an hour, they're doing per, they're doing they're doing pretty good. Mm. Jeff, I was just going to ask you, and you kind of touched on it there. Will this affect like a small mom and pop business differently than it would affect a restaurant group? I mean, I assume you have like an accountant. You're talking about this being a payroll situation. It's more, you know, the details and the paperwork than it is necessarily people working out on the floor. Is this going to tank some businesses that are smaller, do you think? I, I think anytime you disrupt the, the whole way things are done, you have the potential for people not being able to adapt to the situation and um, going out of business. But I'm, I'm not I'm not putting up like a ton of red flags saying that, oh, you know, all these restaurants are going to go out of business. Yeah. I think they ultimately will have to adapt to the system. And, and like I said, I think there's going to be just a bunch of shuffling of money around. And at the end of the day, I think the servers continue to make 30 to $40 an hour and the overall payroll for the company stays approximately the same mm -hmm. and that more of the money just ends up on a paycheck for a server that they get every two weeks as opposed to the money that they like to walk home with on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, Jeff Tracy, better known as Chef Jeff, thank you for coming on the show to really explain this side of Initiative 82. Yeah, complex one, uh, but we look forward to uh, everybody voting on whatever side in on November 8th. Okay, so before we go, we have a little, um, you know, zeitgeist moment here. Yes. You are not on TikTok, but you kind of are. Please out yourself. <laughs> yeah. I, I consume <laughs> TikTok through the process called osmosis, meaning my girlfriend has TikTok and I sometimes just take her phone and I go on her TikTok <laughs> because it's just so funny sometimes. Because it sucks you in. So you turned it off your phone yep. so you wouldn't. Do yeah, it, I keep then... it strictly work because, you know, this podcast is a TikTok. We post there all the time. Yeah. But for just, you know, like pleasure purposes, <laughs> I uh, I steal my girlfriend's phone. Okay. The reason I bring this up is because there's a TikTok that I follow that I think other people might enjoy if you haven't heard of it. But you probably have. Um, the account is called Knuckle Bump Farms. Wow. Like a knuckle bump. Yeah. No, I see it. But <laughs> they have um, farm animals on there that they like somehow found the cutest farm animals ever to show you every day. And, mm -hmm. the, and the girl who does it is really funny. But there's a very popular emu on there. Like an ostrich kind of named thing? Named Emmanuel. Mm. And he apparently got bird flu. And oh, everyone no. is distraught. That's serious. You know, and I guess they, I mean, so I'm not laughing. It's just like, what? How are so many people rallying around this emu? But I guess they lost a bunch of birds on the farm and it's like oh, a big no. deal. But yeah. he's recovering. Good. So that's, you know, one of my favorite little bright spots in my week. In your, t in your TikTok it's, consumption. It, it took a dark turn and now things are improving. For me, I guess this is kind of dark too, but it, it, when I watch them, it's just fantastic. There's like this account that basically goes up to gravestones and refurbishes them. You know, she walks up to these gravestones oh. and they're all right, like covered have in moss, like, yeah, and, moss like... and stuff like She cleans them, kind of restores them basically to their original look, which is beautiful. And then, not only that, she finds the backstory of the gravestone that she's cleaned no kid so, like the, of the person totally yeah so you get oh, to hear these fantastic cool. unknown stories or lesser known stories rather um of these you know gravestones that she's cleaned so one you get to see you know uh very satisfying <laughs> restoration you know like people just, love cleaning videos it's, what is I, that about yeah it got me for sure and then you get to hear like really just true stories about people who died in a 
19th, 18th uh, century. Are they famous people or just no. anybody? No, no, not at all. No. Oh, a lot of them really are like cool. little, so like sometimes they're children, you know, sometimes they're just random people, but they oftentimes have pretty inspirational or touching stories, as most people's lives called? do. To be honest, I do not know. I just kind of scroll oh, and watch. Very but helpful. I'm sure if you search, you know, gravestone cleaning or something like that, you could find it. But okay. be, uh, caution, caution, because you might catch yourself watching these videos for three hours like I do, <laughs> staying up till 2 a.m. and just, you know, being glad about it because they're great videos, but just, you know, make sure you can wake up late the next day I or mean, something. there's, you know, there's some bright spots to social media and there are two of them for you guys to enjoy. <laughs> and that'll do it for us today on the DMV Download. We are brought to you by Steamfitters Local 602. Our managing editor is Craig Schwab and our music is by Real World. Give us a review and rate our show if you get the chance. Also, tell your friends and family about this show. Whoop, whoop. You can also follow us on our social media accounts, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, you mm-hmm. name it. Not be real yet. We're getting there, maybe, one day. <laughs> um, you can also find out more about this podcast on dmvdownload.com, where you can become a VIP listener. The DMV Download is a product of WTOP News. Listen on 103.5 FM in D.C., 107.7 FM in Virginia, 103.9 FM in Frederick, online at WTOP.com and on the WTOP News app. Have a good night.